So when I study history, and certainly when making videos for this channel, I really try to go, go, go about it with the idea of understanding, uh, not judging or celebrating the past. But I have to admit, it's a little hard not to be judgmental when sharing uh, what I'm about to share, which are excerpts from a letter from Leonidas W. Spratt of South Carolina to John Perkins Jr. of Louisiana, uh, protesting the Provisional Confederate Congress's decision to prohibit the African slave trade in the Constitution. Uh, Spratt was not pleased, and what makes the, his letter interesting is uh, the issues it raises about immigration and democracy. He considered democracy a canker, uh, much preferred South Carolina's more aristocratic form of uh, government and social relations. So I think it's interesting to uh, hear on, on those grounds, and uh, I'll try not to throw up in my mouth as I read the excerpts. With immigrants from Europe came slaves from Africa. Step by step, the two in union marched upon the West, and it is reasonably certain, had the means to further union been admitted, that so they would have continued to march upon the West, that slave labor would have been cheaper than hireling labor. But the slave trade suppressed, democratic society has triumphed. The states of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware found an attractive market for their slaves. They found a cheaper, pauper labor to replace it. That pauper labor poured in from Europe. While it replaced the slave, it increased the political power of the northern states. More than five millions from abroad have been added to their number. That addition has enabled them to grasp and hold the government. That government, from the very necessities of their nature, they are forced to use against us. Slavery was within its grasp and forced to the option of extinction in the Union or of independence out, it dares to strike and it asserts its claim to nationality and its right to recognition among the leading social systems of the world. But it may be that to this end, another revolution may be necessary. It is to be apprehended that this contest between democracy and slavery is not yet over. It is certain that both forms of society exist within the limits of the southern states. Both are distinctly developed within the limits of Virginia, and there, whether we perceive the fact or not, the war already rages. In that state, there are about 500,000 slaves to about one million whites. And as at least as many slaves as masters are necessary to the constitution of slave society, about 500,000 of the white population are in legitimate relation to the slaves, and the rest are in excess. Without legitimate connection with the slave, they are in competition with him. They constitute not a part of slave society, but a democratic society. It is thus that Virginia has been undecided, that she does not truly know whether she is of the North or South in this great movement. Her people are individually noble, brave, and patriotic, and they will strike for the South in resistance to physical aggression. But her political action is, at present, paralyzed by this unnatural contest. And as causes of disintegration may continue, must continue, if the slave trade be not reopened, as there will still be a market at the South for her slaves, as there will still be pauper labor from abroad to supply their places, and more abundant from industrial dissolutions at the North, and the one race must increase as the other is diminished, it is to be feared that there the slave must ultimately fail, and that this great state must lose the institution and bend her proud spirit to the yoke of another democratic triumph. In Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and even Tennessee and North Carolina, the same facts exist with chances of the like result. And even in this state, South Carolina, the ultimate result is not determined. Even here, the process of disintegration has commenced. In our larger towns, it just begins to be apparent. 
Within 10 years past, as many as 10,000 slaves have been drawn away from Charleston by the attractive prices of the West, and laborers from abroad have come to take their places. These laborers have every disposition to work above the slave, and if there were opportunity, would be glad to do so. But without such opportunity, they come to competition with him. They are necessarily resistive to the contact. Already, there is the disposition to exclude him from the trades, from public works, from drays, and the tables of hotels he is even now excluded to a great extent. And when enterprises at the North are broken up, when more laborers are thrown from employment, when they shall come in greater numbers to the South, they will still more increase the tendency to exclusion. They will question the right of masters to employ their slaves in any works that they may wish for. They will invoke the aid of legislation. They will use the elective franchise to that end. They may acquire the power to determine municipal elections. They will inexorably use it. And thus this town of Charleston at the very heart of slavery may become a fortress of democratic power against it. As it is in Charleston, so also is it to a less extent in the interior towns. Not only is it in the towns the tendency appears, the slaves from lighter lands within the state have been drawn away for years for higher prices in the West. They are now being drawn away from rice culture. Thousands are sold from rice fields every year. None are brought to them. They have already been drawn from the culture of indigo and all manufacturing employments. They are yet retained by cotton and the culture incident to cotton but as almost every Negro offered in our markets is bid for by the West, the drain is likely to continue. It is probable that more abundant pauper labor may pour in, and it is to be feared that even in this state, the purest in its slave condition, democracy may gain a foothold, and that here the contest for existence may be waged between them. It thus appears that the contest is not ended with the dissolution of the Union, and that the agents of that contest still exist within the limits of the southern states. If, in short, you shall own slavery as the source of your authority and act for it and erect as you are commissioned to erect not only a southern but a slave republic, the work will be accomplished. Your republic will not require the pruning process of another revolution, but poised upon its institutions, will move on to a career of greatness and of glory unapproached by any other nation in the world. But if you shall not, if you shall commence by ignoring slavery, or shall be content to edge it on by indirection, if you shall exhibit care but for a republic, respect but for a democracy, if you shall stipulate for the toleration of slavery as an existing evil by admitting assumptions to its prejudice and restrictions to its power and progress, re-inaugurate the blunder of 1789, you will combine states whether true or not to slavery. You will have no tests of faith. Some will find it to their interest to abandon it. Slave labor will be fettered. Hireling labor will be free. Your confederacy is again divided into antagonist societies. The irrepressible conflict is again commenced. And as slavery can sustain the structure of a stable government and will sustain such structure, and as it will sustain no structure but its own, another revolution comes. But whether in the order and propriety of this is gravely to be doubted. Is it then in the just performance of your office that you would impose a constitutional restriction against the foreign slave trade? Will you affirm slavery by reprobating the means of its formation? Will you extend slavery by introducing the means to its extinction? Okay, that's Leonidas W. Spratt arguing that uh, by banning the African slave trade in the Confederate Constitution, that the Confederates are setting themselves up for the pruning effects of another revolution. So why did the Confederates uh, implement that ban in their constitution? Uh, well, there's more to the story on my website and free newsletter, which I hope you'll subscribe to. You may have to check your inbox for the confirmation email. 
Uh, I don't spam you there. I'll just send you an email each time there's a new post and the videos will be embedded in them. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you'll click the like button, hit subscribe, and share this with anyone you think might be interested. And I'll see you in the next video.